Let's talk a little bit about her situation. Um, what do you think should ha- be happening to her now? Well, good riddance, as far as I'm concerned. Um, she is someone who knew what the Islamic State was before she went out. Um, she put in a lot of planning. Um, including stealing jewellery to fund her flight. Um, She did a lot of research. She had to seek out ISIS fighters uh, to communicate with, to actually make sure she got to Syria in the first place. So um, this is a young lady that shows absolutely no remorse, is uh, who knows what kind of uh, training she's been through. And uh, she remains, as far as I'm concerned, a, a threat to everybody. She was 15 when she went. Um, Do you not think a lot of people are arguing, well, she was clearly brainwashed. She was a child. She couldn't have made all these decisions on her own without in some way being brainwashed. Do we not need to cut a a bit of slack for that? Well, not really. She was above the age of criminal responsibility. At 15, I knew uh, between right and wrong. And she saw, just like everyone else did at home, the images of the Yazidi girls being sold into sexual slavery, girls as young as three years old, young boys and men gunned down in ditches, uh, she saw uh, what ISIS was doing to Syria and Iraq, um, just cutting a sort of a bloody sway throughout just the countryside and it, throughout the cities, Raqqa and Mosul. So, um, no, I just don't get this sort of spin that certain parts of the media are sort of advocating that she's some, somehow a victim. No, the real victims here are the Yazidi girls, uh, are the young men and women who have had their lives ripped to pieces in Syria because of ISIS. So um, for a, a 19-year-old woman now to bleat about her human rights and what she wants to do, no, no, what's what needs to happen now is the future of Syria. That's what we should be discussing. If, if she had been raped, um, everyone would have said that she couldn't. She could not have consented to that when she was 15 because she was 15 is under the legal age of consent. So therefore, um, it, she even if she had said that she consented to it, she couldn't have in, in, she, in under the law. So the, the, the analogy with this surely works. No, I, she she married a, a jihadi, uh, a fighter who who knows what crimes he committed on the front line. Um, she actually, far from showing remorse, not only has she normalised what the Islamic State is and what it stands for, she's actually justified it too, and actually shown regret that she's left the front line in the first place. Um, she's actually seems very self-centred, and I'm actually quite relieved that, that her first interview was so unfiltered. Um, she. Um, a lot of I was speaking actually just recently to a, a Kurdish fighter who's part of the YPG who holds the prisoners and he said to me that um, the Islamic State has been briefing its foreign fighters um, to say just this that they are innocent people that they didn't mean to go out that they were humanitarian workers doctors uh, and that their human rights are being violated they wish to come back to Europe with the eight, the end goal being to renew the violence um, but that, but that means then she clearly has been very much still well, brainwash, it's, it takes away the resp- her responsibility as a woman. Uh, sure, she was 15, but she's 19 now. I, I, I just don't buy that a 15-year-old uh, can't be held criminally responsible. We've done it with uh, uh, the, that young boy that was kidnapped many years ago. Those young boys, I forget the, the names now, excuse me, it's my I'm a different generation. Um, uh, so there's been many examples throughout you, you our mean the recent bul- history. The Bulger case. case, excuse yeah. me. Um, there's been many uh, examples where young uh, people, young men, young boy, uh, young girls um, have faced up to the actions that they decided to take. Uh, and she's, and as I said, there's no, why risk it? What, what do we owe this young lady? She's 19 years old. Uh, the priority of government is to keep people safe in the UK. And also, of course, to deliver justice to all the people that ISIS have actually killed. So I, I just don't quite buy it. If she had shown any remorse in her various interviews, would you think differently about her coming back? Well, I, I, I've, I do not. I actually don't advocate that she should stay abroad. I didn't know before uh, she was stripped of her citizenship, a citizenship that she was a dual national. Uh, I'm actually, now that I know that, I'm glad it happened. But uh, had she been British, I would have said that we, she needed to come back to the UK to face trial. But before that, and I've been advocating it for a very long time now, we needed to stiffen British legislation. Our anti-terror laws are far too weak. Just one in ten jihadis who have come back to the UK from Syria have found themselves in a court courtroom so there is well, already why is that why do you think that is weak, it is weak it be- laws well is it because it's quite difficult to get evidence 
It, well, that's true. And that's why we need to sort of um, narrow down on terror groups in particular. So, for instance, um, just the membership of a terror group, proof that, that you've, you're in their area of uh, responsibility, you providing them material support, things like this should be the catch that we ca capture these people on. There was another case where a young lady uh, went to Syria, joined ISIS, came back, got six years in jail and was out in three, three years. And can you believe, uh, honestly, I've been to Syria, I've heard the testimony of young years Yazidi girls um, who were captured when they were before 10 years old, much younger than this 15 year old who went out to fight and join ISIS. Um, and there, it's I, I wouldn't even want to repeat some of the stories I've heard from these girls. And it's uh, and once you once you see ISIS up close, then you actually can understand how horrendous and horrible they are. Um, so we don't owe this young lady anything. And, I, and I'd be very cautious about re re any returning fighters. Um, Des has texted and to say, I'm struck by the nasty tone of those who are unable to experience compassion. A young British bred girl is brainwashed by a corrupt version of Islam and the response is to turn their back. So a response worthy of IS maybe, but not of a humane person. No, my humanity extends only to ISIS victims, I'm afraid. ISIS people um, are the worst of the worst. They have, they've hit our, us in the UK, they've hit our kids in Manchester, they've hit our democracy on London Bridge. Um, anyone who goes out to join the Islamic State is an enemy of the UK, is a, danger, a, present, a clear and present danger to the UK, and as far as I'm concern, concerned, if they're a dual national, certainly, they can stay out of this country. Let's move on to your own personal story because it, it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I know when we talked before, I thought I, I need an hour with this guy. Well, now, we, now we've got an hour with you. Um, you had a very normal upbringing, didn't you? I, I really did. Um, In fact, very similar to mine, I read. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know what you've read, uh, <laughs> but I, I grew up in Cambridgeshire. Um, on a farm? Uh, you, well, yes, but my, my grandfather was a farmer. My, my, my dad was into like, property development and that sort of stuff. Um, I, I've got two other brothers. Um, I went to a, a local school, small school, um, and... Yeah, well, uh, the, I, if you're looking for any depth to my early life, I'm afraid you're not going to find <laughs> well, much. No, no, what I want to do is to try, I want to get to the point where you made the decision to go and fight in a war zone because, mm. I mean, you, I, I think I said this to you last time, I mean, you, you look an ordinary guy, you, mm. you're not, so you don't look like a sort of war hero or anything. Not at all. How on earth do you get to the point of having a very normal upbringing in Cambridgeshire, you, you go and work in the city, and then... You go to a war zone. Now, how did you get to that point? Well, I'm, I'm morally driven. That's certainly uh, an aspect of my character that you, you could possibly chase, uh, trace to my upbringing. Uh, I presume my parents uh, had a lot to do with that. But I didn't go to Syria until I was 27. So, um, so as I said, and as you said, I had a very much a, a very normal childhood. Uh, I went to university to study politics, so I was very politically aware. Um, and uh, I have to say, very early on, I, I, I started throwing myself into the deep end when it came to human rights, human rights advocacy and that sort of stuff. I, for instance, when I was 19, I went over to Zimbabwe to campaign against Robert Mugabe. Um, I worked so for the no, MDC. No normal person would do that, would they? I no, I disagree. I think <laughs> if you if you're well, it's a pretty dangerous thing to do at the age of 19. Well, it was, and he he did. I was working for a senator there called David Coulter, a, a man who I admire enormously he's a he's a christian uh, he's one of the few white people left in the um, zimbabwean parliament he's been he was a he was anti uh, apartheid anti uh, sort of the, the former regime the racist regime before he was anti them and he's got a huge amount of respect in zimbabwe and and, and spending time with him and his family uh, learning about their struggle what they fought for uh, as i said he's i may not have said actually he's a human rights lawyer as well um just taught me a lot and i was just seeking out i suppose at that time um people to support because I, I wanted to travel. I wanted to stand in solidarity with people. I was young. I was studying politics at university and um, I just wanted to help people more than anything else. So you were working in the city mm -hmm. to all intents and purposes, very normal existence. Um, you had a house, you had a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. What was the moment when you thought, well, I'm going to do something rather extraordinary? Um, well, I, I suppose... It's, it's not something because I don't want to appear too restless, but I did, I did almost fall into the city. I, I graduated more than 10 years ago at the height of the recession, and everything else. Um, it wasn't just in Barbara. I was working in Ethiopia. I had I was doing a lot of charitable work over the years that I was studying um, when I graduated. Then, obviously, in a terrible recession, I thought to myself, I can't I've got to have a job. I can't I, I literally after university, you, 
I was particularly broke. So um, I just fell into the city. I worked there, as I said, for a number of years. Um, and But always in the back of my mind, having that, that conscious, having the desire to keep helping people. And I did take a break from work uh, for six months to volunteer in the Congo. Um, so that there was a there was a sense of, I suppose, restlessness in my early career. But as you say, it's pretty, pretty normal. And the moment that you decided to go to Syria? It wasn't a, a moment like a sudden urge, I have to say. Like, um, so over a period of, I suppose, six months, uh, I suppose, well, the best way to describe it is, and, and, and the listeners at home, I think, will understand this. In the sort of summer of 2014, when ISIS were rising up, when Mosul fell, when we saw those journalists on their knees, we saw Jihadi John exploded onto our onto our television screens, and ISIS was on everyone's minds, and it, we were just appalled every single week. Another, they went down deeper into the depths of depravity. Um, and I became fascinated with it, shocked by it, disgusted by it, horrified by it. And I was watching it every single day on my, um, uh, because I, I worked in currency trading. Uh, my job was to advise and talk to clients. I, my, much of my mornings, well, for the first few hours of the day, I'd often just be trawling through the news, seeing what's moving the markets. So I suppose I was exposed to this news more than anyone else. Um, and then given my background and everything else, maybe it was a bit of a, I'd say a toxic mix, perhaps that's not the right word, but certainly um, something stirred inside me and I thought to myself, is there anything that I can do? And, it, and the first thing, and I'm sure people at home would say, why didn't you just carry on working for a charity? Why didn't you go to Jordan and help the refugees there, the people who were flooding out the country in the hundreds of thousands? But one of the things I was particularly horrified about was that the British government, the American government, wasn't doing anything. The only people who were fighting back against ISIS were the local people, and they were outgunned and outnumbered. ISIS were, were killing them in ditches by the hundreds, capturing them in the thousands. So dealing with refugees in Jordan felt like I was, I'd only ever deal with the, the symptoms of the problem. And if I actually wanted to deal with the root causes or actually stand in solidarity with Syrians, I would have to um, get on a plane and go find them and, and go and, and join them and f fight alongside them, do whatever I could to help them. And did you tell anyone here what you were about to do? I did not, um, which in hindsight is one of the most foolish things. And I, and again, I suppose you or anyone at home would, would think how silly it was not to tell your, your parents or your brothers. But I, I, foolishly, I thought perhaps of keeping them safe, that I would go for six months, that I would come back. Um, that I knew that there would be an agony in the, uh, while I was out there. But then I, I was also torn by the fact that if I was killed out there, then their, their shock would be magnified by me not telling them and then getting a random call from the Foreign Office, let's say. So um, it's bizarre. It's, it's hard for me to even talk about now um, to be selfless, to, to wa actually want to help people. Uh, strangers you actually have to hurt the, the people that love you the most and one of the hardest things about being out there was the fact that my mother and father that my brothers were at home and that they would that I would be dead if I died but they would live with a life sentence so uh, I don't want anyone to think that I was naive on this subject. So wh when did you tell them or how did they find out what you were doing? Well they it, it came out piecemeal almost um, uh, the, the work I eventually told them after about a month in country um, and then it was magnified by uh, the press which um, had a bit of a field day early on which in hindsight with by not telling them and by um, yeah just so allowing did, how, it to be how, uncontrolled how I think. did it get in the press well, it's uh, when you, when you're a six foot four white Englishman sounding like the, the, like I do, uh, people tend to t start taking photos of you. So, um, and, uh, and, and what was the reaction from your family and friends? Did they did they think that you'd lost it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, my family were horrified. They they were uh, incredibly shocked. They didn't know why I was there. Um, they. As obviously some friends were very supportive I think on the whole most people weren't believe it or not because it, it was just the fact they didn't understand why I was there I'd never bothered articulating it to them and of course uh, they my background hints at it and, and one of the things actually I, I hasten to say that over time time is a healer and my family are now very supportive of what I what I do that was way back in 2000 let's say early 2015 uh, by the time Raka came along 2017 by the time I was sort of 
uh, campaigning in Europe, in America, uh, for political support for the Kurds. Uh, because, by the way, this was not just about fighting, it was about standing in solidarity with people and utilising my experiences in politics and working with hu uh, humanitarian groups to actually advance their cause. Um, so time's a healer, but yeah, the, the early days were pretty tough. We'll find out more about what happened when you first landed uh, in Turkey and then moved on to Syria in just a moment. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. I'm talking to Mesa Gifford, a former currency trader who left the UK to fight Daesh in Syria. It's 20 past eight. Um, lots of you uh, texting and tweeting in. Kevin in East Sussex says, wow, Ian, this guy is amazing. I would vote for him. Well, though, you, never, you might get the chance one day. Who knows? Uh, Mesa Gifford is with me. Um, he's here because, well, partly um, when I interviewed him last year, it was uh, all too short and I wanted to have a much longer discussion with him about his experience in Syria and that's what we're going to move on to now. Um, we've talked about why you felt motivated to go. When you first, well you landed in Turkey I think, didn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Um, what happened then? So I didn't go, I didn't cross over from Turkey I have to say. I, I flew into Turkey, spent a day there uh, and then flew on to Suleymaniye in northern Iraq, I suppose, well southern Kurdistan um, and from there met up with YPG um, contacts with Kurds. How, how do you even make those contacts? <laughs> well bizarrely in those early days it doesn't happen like this anymore uh, in fact and it's winding down now that ISIS is gone but uh, in the early days, the Kurds put out a call for international support. Um, they didn't have uh, any weapons uh, to fight against ISIS. The YPG itself formed because young men and women started to stuff their pockets, their jeans pockets with bullets, grab their old sort of their family AK, uh, which I suppose some people have in Syria and Iraq, and they ran out to start to defend their communities. And uh, they started to call for internationals to come out and fight alongside them. And they did this via Facebook, uh, small media groups. And because of my access, because I was reading so much and so widely, I discovered them. So I just contacted them on Facebook, believe it or not. Um, and they arranged for, obviously I paid for my flights, but they arranged for someone to meet me at the airport. And when you first met them, I mean, yeah. How do you? How did you feel yourself? Because I mean, I'm trying to put myself in your position, which of course I, I can't. But if if I was there, sort of meeting these people for the first time, I would be bricking it. Um, I. I was I was quite confident because other internationals had gone before me, so I was very confident that I was speaking to the right people. Um, I. Um, I, when when they met me, the first thing they said they would do, to, do was show me a picture of me and say my name. So when I walked past someone who just came up to me and said hello and actually gave me the wrong name, I said, nope, sorry, and carried on walking until finally he caught up with me. And uh, I got into the car quite nervously. Uh, there was two other Kurdish men got into the back who didn't speak uh, any English. And we drove to a safe house and I sort of glanced, I used to, I would glance nervously into the back of the vehicle for it, it was basically pretending that we're having a conversation, keeping an eye on everything. And I was only assured when we finally got into the safe house and there was YPG flags on the wall. And I thought, actually, I think ISIS wouldn't go to this much effort to kidnap me. So um, I was actually assured. And, and from there on, you just had to... One of the things that early internationals didn't understand was you have to put all of your faith in the YPG and the Kurds. If you couldn't do that, you had no business being in Syria. Um, many internationals tried to go out and failed. Um, many stayed on the internet talking amongst themselves, telling each other how much they wanted to fight ISIS, but never got that. It's like standing on the edge of a waiting to jump out of a plane with a parachute on or doing a bungee jump. You actually have that, that commitment to just leap uh, into the void and um, and actually not very many people can do that um, Carol, by the way, if you want to phone in and ask Mesa any questions about his experience, uh, do feel free, 0345 6060 I've got some text here. Carol saying, according to recent changes in the law, your guest should be in jail for his trip rather than being celebrated and treating like a hero. God alone knows what he did. Well, we'll come on to what he did in a moment, but um, it is slightly incongruous, isn't it, that, that we're, we're talking about people who went to, to Syria to fight for Daesh uh, not allowing them back in the country or if they do come back being tried yeah. um, people do make the argument that you should be in the same position Sure, um, I, I disagree but I can see their arguments um, well, the, the law is quite clear if you join a terrorist group a listed terrorist group you will go to jail no doubt about that If you, um, for a start the YPG is not it's an ally of the UK and of America uh, it literally translates as people's protection units uh, it, it's a 
police force, uh, sort of a local police force fighting back against ISIS and securing uh, people's homes. So um, therein lies the grey area. Uh, for me. Um, I went out to support local people. I believe in democracy. The police, sure, have stopped me under Section 7 of the Anti-Terrorism Act. They've questioned me, uh, but released me, presumably because they know that they've got much bigger things on their minds uh, than people that go out to fight the Islamic State. Um, so there, there, well, there it is. Okay. So you get to the safe house. Um, you don't have military training, as I understand it. So how did you... Did you get training from the Kurds? Yeah, well, I um, back in 2015, it was a very different environment. ISIS was still growing. Um, the Kurdish uh, military was in still a bit of disarray. Uh, they had tried a few counterattacks um, in the months leading up to my arrival, which had failed terribly uh, with significant losses. Um, and um, and. Yeah, the advance of ISIS was ongoing. They were t they, I think they had just taken Palmyra just before I arrived. So um, I arrived at a state of confusion. I only had about one week to familiarize myself with um, Kurdish weaponry and that sort of stuff, which is sort of Soviet weaponry, as, uh, as people can imagine. Um, but uh, I met for the first time the first few hundred internationals that would eventually go out to Syria. And actually one of the blessed things that actually happened to me when I first arrived was I did very, very little for the first few months. I was packed off to a front line, but it was a front line where ISIS was still only a mile away. And, and where I was, it hadn't quite moved in a while, at least sort of three months or something. So um, there was not even a mortar whistled over my head for the first uh, month or two. So I was with uh, about 80% in those days of internationals had military experience. Um, some incredibly talented people. A friend of mine, Nathan, he was a British guy, he had been in the French Foreign Legion for seven years, he'd in two rep, had just come out. And the first thing that the internationals decided to do was to start, um, because they come came from all around the world they had very different levels of military experience and and often somewhere in the french military british military american military they had to actually establish a common understanding of uh, of how they would operate out there um so for the first couple of months it was actually just fantastic to be with other foreigners uh, training alongside them and um coming where, up with a where did they come from Everywhere, as you could possibly imagine. They came from America. They were former servicemen who fought in Iraq. They were British men, um, some with military experience, some without. Uh, and were, were they thrill seekers? There was a real mixture. Um, internationals, uh, I, in the early days, I went out and I was quite clear with the Kurds that I wanted to fight alongside them. I wanted to uh, at least do that. Uh, but the, the more that I could do, or the value added, was to utilise the fact that I had a voice in the UK, that I could come back and talk um, to articulate what they couldn't. Because one of the things I identified pretty quickly uh, was the fact that they are suffering from a PR problem. This, this is a uh, people that... By the way, there's not just the YPG, it's the YPJ as well, which is their female equivalent. They have feminism at the very core of everything they do. Uh, they believe in democracy, they believe in uh, secularism, they believe in a, a unified Syrian state um, without Assad, obviously, but... Um, one that's democratic so it was it, it their story is one that is absolutely remarkable and their heroic resistance from isis to, to actually stop them in kobani and then eventually start turning them around and then get international volunteers was a story that i wanted to tell um but as you can imagine if internationals are coming from around the world all kinds of people were sort of turning up 25 to 9 here on lbc we're talking to mesa gifford former currency trader who left the uk to fight daesh in syria um We'll come to one or two of your calls in a moment. In fact, I'm looking forward to the first call, which is actually from a bill in Kurdistan. We'll come to that in a second. What made you think, Mesa, that you could actually be a fighter? Because I, I know, if I, try, I again, I can't really put myself in your situation. And I think it's very different. If you are... If, if there's a war situation in your own country and you are, you have no alternative but to mm -hmm. fight, you will fight. But um, when you got there, how how were you? How confident were you that you could actually hack it? Well, I was very confident. Um, look, fighting there there is uh, such a thing as a just fight. If you see what ISIS has done, as I did on the news, um, I. Um, there's there's instant sympathy, and there is a there's actually a lot of people willing to go out of their way to help others and um we'll just look at uh 
uh, look at the Spanish Civil War with internationals from all around the world going to fight against the fascists there. And ISIS is a fascist organization. It butchers people. So it's quite unsurprising that hundreds um, of internationals went to go and fight them too. So history does tend to repeat itself in that regard. Um, I want, I, I, to honest you, as far as you can be confused about me wanting to fight ISIS, I am almost confused that people find it confusing oh really oh, that's i really do that well i spoke to one journalist who, who looked me in the eye and said uh, who said he couldn't understand it and i gave no, the most analogy. people think you were barking mad possibly but i hear this uh, anecdote then at least or one, this example i said to this journalist once uh, if you were in your house and you heard a commotion in the next door neighbor's house and you peeked through the window and you saw a man banging on the door of a house of a young family um what would you do would you just sort of sit back and let someone else deal with it call the police or would you sort of call the the people who are getting their house their door kicked in and say i'm so sorry you've got my sympathy obviously uh for what's happening to you or would you pick up your own baseball bat and would you go around and actually make certain the wolf is away from their door or actually go and help them and this well the, the journalist in question said oh no i, I you wouldn't do that I thought, are you crazy? Are you mad? Well, I probably would do that. I'd like to well, think I go. would. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't travel 2,000 miles to risk my life. And for ISIS. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just, at the end of the day, um, I, um, the Brits and the Americans weren't doing anything. The Kurdish people were fighting back, and they weren't winning at the time. Uh, ISIS was winning. And um, who knew where they were going to go next? Uh, Turkey. Were they going to be in Lebanon? Were they going to be in Jordan next? How far was this so-called caliphate going to grow? And I just couldn't sit around in the UK and okay. watch it all happen. Right, let's go to Alan, who's phoned in from Erbil in Kurdistan. Alan, what would you like to say? Yeah, hiya. Hi. Yeah, I'm agreeing with most of what uh, what Mies was saying. Um, I was speaking to Yazidis yesterday, victims of Daesh, and they're all asking about where's the justice when see, people seem to be forgetting all of this, you know. Um, you've got hundreds of Daesh that are still here, hundreds that have returned to the UK to walk our streets. Um, you've also got the Kurds now. They need protection and they need support from the West to deal with this problem. This is only the start. Daesh isn't finished. There's an um, insurgency already started in Iraq and there'll be one starting, I'm sure, in Syria as well soon, in the likes of Rojava and what have you. You know, so the threat is, it's far from over. Uh, um, what are you doing in a bill, Alan? Um, I'm doing a documentary now, so the camera is the weapon. Uh, basically, I'm interviewing the, the people that fought against us from day one, the uh, victims of, of ISIS and um, Dash themselves, their mentality. Show, well, show people what their mentality actually is. People and, uh, still don't understand it. Well, I look forward to seeing that. Well, when will it be coming out, do you know? Oh, how long is it? I'm on what you call Kurdish time. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken a long time. to. This has to get right. It's, you have to get to see the right people. You have to... There's just so much to it. It's just too complicated to do in a month, two months, three months. You have to put a, a lot of time and effort into it. And how, I don't know if you've... And you have um, to build up trust. I don't know if you've interviewed people and asked them what they think of the foreign fighters that have come to fight yeah. for the Kurds. And what, what's yeah. the general attitude? Yeah. Well, uh, basically, the, the the feeling... I was going around the camp yesterday, and I was also speaking to the director of the Yazidi Kidnap Rescue Centre. The crimes were committed here. The trial should be held here. Justice should be done here. And the local laws should be used to deal with these people. These people left... The West. You've got to remember, most of the Western Dash, they're well educated. They they knew, they tasted, they know what democracy is. They're actually more committed to the so-called caliphate fate and the ideology than than a lot of the local ISIS who joined for different reasons. Whereas Western Dash tended to join purely because of the ideology. So people here they want justice done. The crimes were committed against them on their soil. Um, another thing is, we've got the people screaming about dash rights, get them back to the UK, etc. However, what about, what about, you've got British soldiers that have been getting investigated and all the rest of this for so, you know, um, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Northern Ireland. Yet, we've got hundreds of dash that's returned to the UK freely walking the streets, 
Now, where's the investigations? Where's the investigators been sent across here, the lawyers, to investigate the people that have returned to the UK? Yeah, well, it's a good question. Um, Alan, thank you very much indeed. That's Alan calling in from Abil in Kurdistan. Um, let's quickly go to Christine in Shepherd's Bush. Christine, you've got a question for Mesa, I believe. Yes, I have. I've, I've been listening with absolute fascination and, and great admiration uh, to your guests. And before I ask my question, question, can I quickly say, those who are suggesting that they're, uh, you know, the fact that you went out there, you are equally uh, uh, should be tried uh, along with the likes of that particular young lady. Could I just remind them that this isn't the first time that uh, foreigners have gone off to fight in uh, a just war. My my own father went to fight the fascists during the Spanish Civil War. He was an Irish national. And then in 1939, he joined the British Army simply because he knew he was fighting a far greater evil that he wasn't fighting, uh, you know, going there to fight with people who uh, hated this country. And that that is the huge difference, which people seem to be forgetting. Um, But anyway, uh, my respect to to your guest. But uh, could I ask, what does he feel about uh, the lack of support that the West and Britain in particular has offered uh, to the Kurds? Uh, yeah, for all they've suffered, uh, okay. you know, the West has really helped them very little. Okay. Yeah, well, and bless you. Thank you so much for your kind words. And uh, my utmost respect to your father as well. He seems like an amazing person. Um, I, I have to say, the, the lack of attention from the rest of the world on the Kurdish cause has been pretty appalling. Uh, Britain and America... For decades. For decades. Uh, absolute decades. And uh, the past few years in particular with ISIS, the rise of ISIS, the destruction of Yazidi communities, the destruction of Kurdish communities as well... Um, just mean it's just it's a stain on our conscience that um that local people with very little resources are the ones that are fighting isis who are our enemies too and although isis wasn't britain's fault we did we have done things uh, in our foreign policy and other things that have contributed to the rise of isis namely for instance the aftermath of the iraq war these sort of things so um if we had anything to do with the rise of ISIS, anything whatsoever, then we should be the first people to stand forward and help the people who are fighting back uh, with small arms, with political support, with humanitarian aid. But nothing is going over there. Um, There is obviously the coalition now, which is doing wonderful work, particularly America. But what I want to see from Britain is a clear plan to help rebuild Syria, a plan to recognize the Kurdish people, recognize the SDF and, and their political aspirations and uh, really come up with a pathway to peace and uh, and help uh, Syria get back on its feet. Well, in a moment, we're going to talk to Mason more about his experiences of fighting in Syria. And um, uh, I, I, I hope we're not going to run out of time because I, I, I feel maybe I should have come to that a little bit before. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's Mason Gifford with me until nine o'clock. It's quarter to nine. Eight forty-eight. We're talking to Mason Gifford about his experiences in Syria. Uh, Kate in Tufnell Park has got an interesting question for you, Mason. Kate, what would you like to say? Oh, hello. Um, I'd just like to ask if um, you worked alongside. Is it the Peshmerga women? Oh, I work beside, alongside the YPJ, which is the uh, right. Women's Protection Units. So, because just... I, so, go on. I saw them, uh, there was... A, so I've actually kept the picture of them, I know it sounds mm-hmm. pathetic, but in March the 26th, 2016, there was a great um, line in the paper about them, and, and one of the girls said, if I die, I want to look pretty, because she had her makeup on. <laughs> I just... I just feel so proud of these girls. I just wondered what it was like, what they were really like. Yeah. Because they- well, to answer your question, um, well, I, I was alongside the YPJ, and the Kurdish people are, are a remarkable people. Um, the, one thing you must understand is that the Peshmerga are in Iraq, or in Iraqi Kurdistan, and they're fighting against the Islamic State and, and, uh, and with great heroics there. Um, in Syria, it's the YPG and the YPJ, which is actually a, sort of a different fraction of Kurds. And uh, the YPJ are... Uh, an all-female for- force. They've been fighting ISIS from the very beginning. Um, it's very much part of the Kurdish ideology to have men and women fighting together. As I said before, feminism is very much part of their uh, their sort of belief, their core beliefs. And these women are absolutely remarkable. I can remember one time um, 
being shamed by them quite frankly at how brave and wonderful they are which actually goes to show that the the real heroes in this story by the way are the local people it's not the internationals uh, we went out there to help to to fight alongside and to draw attention now the ypg and the ypj they've been fighting from the very beginning and they'll stay there because they're fighting for their homes and they're fighting for their people and everything else and uh, i can remember one instance um coming up to a village called til nazri in northern syria and uh, it was in the middle of the night um and it, i thought that it was falling to pieces because we were as we left our trench and started walking towards the uh village which was about 400 meters away across open ground a tank came up behind us with its headlights on and illuminated us uh, uh like you wouldn't believe like the it was like day again and but nothing happened until we got about 20 meters away 20 30 meters away and then all hell blo uh, broke loose and um i hit the deck i was lying on the ground um to begin with i was firing back but the fire was so intense that you couldn't move you could hear the bullets from the tank from and it was sorry coming from the village the fire coming from the oh, village see, right. and it was pinging off the tank the tank in fact actually reversed and, and left it fired a few shells into the isis village but left us because i think they're possibly worried about an anti-tank uh, missile being fired at it so they left us 30 meters away from the village pinned down and getting shot up and i can remember in one in one moment turning and looking and seeing a ypj girl 18 years old stand up with an rpg and fire it straight into the village and then dive down back onto her belly and these ypj girls uh, as, were, were, were there as well and i fought alongside them throughout the years that i was in syria including in raqqa clearing buildings with them going mo moving forward but through alleyways up stairwells and in, in the middle most of the time in the middle of the night and um they i was just astounded by their bravery so i'm not surprised you've heard of them. when you talk about clearing buildings i mean if you mm. were in the british army you'd have weeks of training about how to do this what to look out for and all the rest of it mm -hmm. were you doing it blind well you do it the the kurdish way which is uh well certainly towards the end the americans had provided uh the kurds with a homemade device which you could throw into a build, uh, room and it would it was like a percussion device it would blow up the entire room and anything inside it would blow up as well um it, that wasn't just an anti-personnel mind mind you the, the one of the biggest risks of clearing a building was the ieds particularly in racket it was mm. you couldn't move uh, dozens of people within my unit were injured and killed by IEDs. So, um, yeah, uh, you have to do it. Uh, so the foreigners, even those, and believe this, believe me, believe it or not, the foreigners without military experience uh, did much better in Syria than the guys with military experience. Why was that? Well, the reason for that was the, the military guys couldn't quite hack how the locals were doing it. They couldn't, they couldn't believe that they were... Uh, the, the operations in which you would lose 20%, 30% of your unit, uh, there was no chance of medical evacuation, there was no air support, there was uh, no tank, no uh, AP, uh, APG, oh, APG, sorry, armoured personnel carrier that will take you forward um, or even take you back. So um, I suppose it was it was those that really learnt the local language, that immersed themselves in Kurdish culture, were the ones that really thrived. Um, I don't know how freely you can talk about killing people, but... Well, the, the truth is, I haven't. Well, You haven't killed... You didn't kill anyone? Well... <laughs> what was the point of it, then? What's the point of it all? Well, it's messy. And look, and this is this is what I've always said. Uh, I may have killed somebody, but did I see a man stand up in front of me and did I shoot him dead? Uh, no, I did not. Um, I went on dozens, hundreds of operations in the, in the years that I was in Syria. I've been shot myself. Uh, my body arm was hit by a bullet. Um, men have died next to me. Um, I, and literally died in my arms. So I've come as close to the Islamic State as possible. In Raqqa particularly, they were on the other side of the street. They were, you could hear them running up and down the buildings uh, next door to you. They were screaming at us in anger. Um, and uh, the, the air support would come in so close that we were in the kill zone of it. It would bring our building down as well. Um, uh, so we, we, it, we were incredibly close to ISIS, but I... And although I fired my rifle at every flash in the dark, every blur of movement, every shadow, um, even though I tossed grenades, fired RPGs, and, uh, and most of the time worked as a medic, if I'm honest, I, um, I didn't know if I ever shot someone. And I'm not the kind of man who would ever brag about it. I'm just not interested. And in, I didn't go there to kill. I went there to be standing inside long, alongside people. Because I was reading an interview that you did um, about 18 months ago, um, where you said you wouldn't hesitate to pull the trigger whenever you had the chance. Mm. Were these shootings murder? Not at all, he says. This was ISIS. Mm. I don't consider them people. I'd shoot a rat in a hay barn with more emotion. Well, I, maybe I was being... Um 
a bit coarse there. Um, but no, it's certainly true. Um, that's a, perhaps an unfiltered interview with me. But I, but it's true. At the end of the day, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have hesitated for a second to shoot ISIS. And believe me, I, I would have tried. And when you were shooting, when you were in those situations, I mean, obviously the adrenaline must be flowing. Mm. I mean, what what does it feel like? What, what, what were you? Was there a, a thrill that you were experiencing? Um, a sort of almost a high. No, um, you're sort of. It depends the circumstance. I've described sometimes you've got a sort of a ferometer, um, which goes up and down according to how much uh, how much someone's shooting at you. Um, Sometimes when you're running between buildings and you're actually uh, sort of advancing to contact, I suppose you could say, um, you're, sometimes it feels for a second that, you're, uh, that something's driving you forward, that, um, that you, you're finding strength from somewhere, and it's very hard to describe. Um, you react instinctively um, and quickly. Um, sometimes you think to yourself, why am I doing this? Uh, there was one time uh, where um, I was crossing a road with two other guys and we were ambushed by ISIS. The first guy got shot and died straight away. The other guy was badly injured. Uh, I ran off the road. And when I realized that one of the guys was still alive out there, I went back and got him. And that feeling of being back on that road was like, honestly, was like a, my heart was in a vice. I could, I could barely breathe. And I can, I can still remember to this day the feeling of my chest filling uh, my body armor so much so that it felt like my body armor was like a vice like it was squeezing me in and I could barely breathe and I just grabbed the guy by his shoulders and dragged him off and um, nothing happened um, the, well uh, shortly afterwards about two minutes later they started actually shooting the, the body of the other guy um, and they attacked us um, but yeah I mean you just you do things almost without thinking what, what, what was the nearest you came to being killed being shot myself in my body armor. I was in the same incident, in fact. So we were, uh, I was with my commander. We were crossing the road, and um, uh, he just said, let's go. And we started going um, quite quickly, and suddenly all hell broke loose. Um, uh, and uh, basically ISIS, uh, I heard this later, someone else told me, that ISIS had been coming down the road, um, and they were only about 20, 30 meters away, and they shot left to right. Commander died first. The second guy was hit, and he would die later after I got him off the road. And then I was already spinning on my heel. I was already, in fact, I hit the dirt face first. I smacked into the ground, um, and it, I didn't even know that had been hit. I actually crawled off the road, went into a building, and it was only shortly afterwards uh, that someone pointed at my magazine vest, and uh, I looked down, and a, a bullet had ripped through my uh, webbing, through one of my magazines, sending all the, the rounds were rattling around inside, and um, and out the other side, and I, I survived by inches. Pam says, please ask him about the 21 Coptic Christian Egyptian men ISIS killed on a beach. Did this make him go? It affected many of us. He's mm. very brave. Well, it's... Um, <sighs> Yes, well, all, all of the above. Uh, the things that motivated me the most, I suppose, was Jihadi John. The fact that this British guy was, was there, a, a British man from London, had gone all the way to join the Islamic State, and now he was cutting off the heads of journalists and, and aid workers. There was a, a, an intense amount of anger um, and just frustration that Britain, I, if I was the Prime Minister of the UK, I would have bombed ISIS until their heads spun. I would have had 3,000 British Marines on Sinjar Mountain getting the Yazidis off. Uh, there was 20,000 Yazidis dying of thirst. And I was sitting there watching it thinking, who is going to help them? And believe it or not, it wasn't just the, the YPG that went. It was actually the PKK as well, uh, which is a registered terrorist organization in the UK that left the mountains of northern Iraq and rescued the Yazidi girls. Uh, off the mountain, I mean. Um, and then other things, the, the girls in cages and the b men being drowned in cages. So it was just the utter horror and the depravity of ISIS that made me just want to go out and fight against them. Well, I've got a lot more questions for you. So executive decision, uh, as long as you're happy, will you stay over I'm for more than a happy, few minutes? Because yeah. um, I think we've still got a bit of ground to cover. LBC, what a great interview on LBC at the moment with Ian Dale. I could listen to this guy for another hour. It's fascinating, interesting, and an incredible insight. Well, that's the reason we've, um, we've kind of kidnapped Mesa, basically, <laughs> in the studio for at least another few minutes, because there's so much that uh, I want to cover with him. Um,
Let's, uh, if you've just tuned in, because I know often people do tune in at the top of the hour, Mesa is a former currency trader who left the UK to fight Daesh in Syria, and we've been talking to him about his experiences there. Um, Mesa, you were on the front line when Raqqa was liberated. Mm -hmm. Um, You witnessed the exodus of hundreds of ISIS fighters. That must have been quite an experience. Yeah, it was actually kind of the end for me, because if you remember that I went out well, 2014, let's say I arrived to 1st of January 2015. Um, and I had seen ISIS grow. It had motivated me to go out. I then um, spent three years fighting in place on in little villages, little hamlets, I'd, uh, in, in desert environments, uh, flat, uh, flat fields, um, in mountains, uh, because Syria is a beautiful country. And I've, and, I, and, and I've spent a long time sort of uh, alongside not just Kurds, but also Syriacs, Christians, um, Arab units as well, uh, Yazidi units as well, that are all joining together because the group that I would eventually join is the SDF. And uh, so by the time Raqqa came along, it was just, um, it was just, it felt like the end, the end of the so-called caliphate. It was their, it was their military capital, if Mosul was their cultural capital. And, uh, and although obviously ISIS has lasted for another year or two uh, after the fall of, uh, of, of Raqqa, that was the real last uh, defense, the, the, the last way they could ever say that they were a, a functioning state. So um, going into the city for the first time, um, it was a siege-like uh, mentality. There was still about 6,000, uh, five to 6,000 ISIS fighters in the city. There was about 10,000 or so, 15,000 SDF on the outside. Hundreds of American troops at this point now calling in airstrikes. There's, the sky was full of planes and drones uh, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, the contrast between then and when I first arrived in Syria, when you wouldn't see an American soldier, you wouldn't see a drone in the sky, um, was just chalk and cheese. And then they also had supplied us with the ability to call airstrikes as well. So, uh, and then obviously the YPG had professionalized over the three years. They had better equipment. So um, it was um, it was a it was just incredible going to the city first for the first time, going through fighting through uh, streets um, for the first time for me, high rise buildings, um, shops. Um, and what, about civilians. what was it like? I mean, because all the television pictures mm. we see, and I think that's one of the weaknesses of this conflict, that t- telev- television pictures are actually quite hard to get. Um, wh- when you saw the conditions, the, the, the wreckage of all the buildings, the living conditions of those that have been living there under mm. ISIS rule, tell us a little bit about that. Well, this, the city did get devastated by the fighting. Entire buildings would come down. Uh, and we, um, and so we would go into a building, for instance, and um, we would... Uh, with another would sort of bunny hop we'd take one building then someone else would take another building and sometimes an entire building would be rigged with explosives and it was literally luck your unit goes into one building you'd see another unit come into your building first you'll shake their hands you'll give them the whatever water they need and they'll go to the next building and then bam an enormous explosion would go off and uh five or six uh, sort of shattered bodies would come back um and it was so it was incredibly random uh, the the violence was was um, it was just random, sudden. It was uh, bloody. Hundreds and hundreds of uh, YPJ fighters, YPG fighters were killed in the city. And um, yeah, so by the end, and you, to answer your question more directly, when I got to the hospital and we'd already broken their defense by this point, they had, the city had fallen into what I would almost describe as a hostage situation, whereby ISIS had, uh, the front line had collapsed. They'd gone into large places like the hospital, like the stadium. They had hundreds of prisoners, including young Yazidi girls, as hostages. And we surrounded them. And we had a choice, we either assault these fortified locations, suffering our own casualties, and also risk the death of the hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, captured uh, innocents. Um, or we allow the ISIS fighters to leave the city as broken people. And the decision was made to let the few hundred survivors go. And presumably there's no interaction with them. Well, there, I did. There was uh, one minute we were fighting. Uh, in fact, the, the day before, the, the closest person who died to me uh, towards the end was the day before uh, they i think it was about 12 o'clock in the morning uh, or 11 o'clock in the morning when they said to us uh, to stop shooting at isis and then the previous evening one of our guys had been shot by a sniper and killed and it was just incredibly sad because he was the last guy i knew in the city to die and um the next morning they said to us 
it's over. Stop shooting at them. They're going. We're going to send buses to go pick them up. And um, slowly around the city, people started to emerge onto the rooftops uh, because one, and it was ISIS that did it first. I remember someone ra excitedly ran up to me and he said, look, look, look. And I looked out the window at the hospital and there was an ISIS fighter just sitting in the window without a care in the world, where just the day before we would have shot him without, mm. uh, without even hesitating. And um, I, I was just almost afraid. Like it had been programmed into me for so long that to, to fear uh, going outside to fear going on the rooftops to fear standing in a window that uh, I sort of emerged onto the roof and I saw other people around the city emerging to the roof flags were being risen and then it started to become real as we saw them limping around outside the hospital getting into these buses and then they started to burn things they started to burn all the paperwork all the documents of their their, their sick state uh, and smoke plumes emerged all over the city, the stadium particularly. You can even hear the gun, um, they started to burn ammunition as well, so a crackling of gunfire um, emerged as well, but they were just burning their stores because they didn't want us to have it. And when did you decide to come back? Pretty much straight after that. I, I, I felt like I'd done, like uh, three years. ISIS was growing when I arrived. They were limping out of their, their the capital city when I left, and I just wanted to come home because I want people to, at home to understand I didn't go out just to fight. Fighting, I've always said, is the least that I did because I wanted just to fight alongside the people who were their real heroes to me, which are the Kurdish people, with the Syriac people, with the Syrian people, with the Arab people. And I, um, I wanted to do what they did. I wanted to stand in solidarity with them. But much more than that, I could come home now after Raqqa and I could start telling my story. I could start working with the Kurds. I could start traveling. I could, uh, I started, I do a lot of writing uh, articles. I've written many articles over the years. I've done, taken part in documentaries. Um, I've done videos that have gone viral. I've got a large social media presence. So it's all about just articulating the Kurdish experience in, in, in my own way, which is a British way, which is the way I hopefully people can understand. And how difficult was it to adjust back to normal British life? And, wh and what happened when you came back? I mean, you said the authorities questioned you. How did that come about? Well, they've um, yeah, they, they've questioned me a few times. Um, they, to be honest, they be waiting for you outside after this interview. Well, possibly. <laughs> I just hope common sense prevails. I've I've said to them, and I've said to any journalist who's asked that at the end of the day, I've I've always been honest from the very beginning. Um, except maybe possibly to my parents in those first in that first month as people just heard but the but to the authorities i've been very very clear i, I will give you whatever you need and at the end of the day if it's a crime to fight the islamic state then i'm guilty but i will stand up in court and i'll drag you all the way to the supreme court um because obviously it is an illegal gray area but from a moral perspective perspective alone i am so comfortable for, with what i've done um what's next for syria Syria has got this, for the first time, I'm starting to feel some hope in Syria. Uh, Syria has been a terrible, terrible thing. Millions have died. Um, uh, people's lives have been ripped apart. In country, a beautiful, beautiful country has been ripped apart. It's history uh, eradicated. And, and just the, the sort of, it's not just ISIS, but other jihadi groups as well have, has, have poisoned a generation. So um, with such a terrible sort of past, I now want to look to a future which is actually more progressive, which actually can unite people. And now 30% of Syria, that's sort of east of the Euphrates, which is liberated by the SDF, the group that I was with, is now American-backed. Although now the Americans are talking about pulling out. Those places, kids are in school now. I, I, I've gone to the villages that I fought in and I've seen kids and families so you, so back you in have, their you houses. Have been back. I, I, I've, when, funnily enough, over the years, I would go forwards and every time I went back again, life was emerging in the areas that we were liberating sort of thing it's, it's hard to describe um certainly if you go way back to 2015 all the villages that i fought in all those ho those houses where i've i held friends who died are all kids are in them families are in them and um life is going on in syria now and it's going on in, under the the kurdish people uh and it's it's quite remarkable and it, and that's what we need to support if we don't if we somehow leave syria to assad to iran to Russia, if we allow uh, the jihadis to come back, or if we allow uh, the FSA, which has now been corrupted by jihadism, to, to flourish and to stay in Syria, um, then we, we've really lost this war. And so, it was all for nothing. So what are you doing now? So I'm, well, I'm a student, again, believe it or not, I'm doing a master's in security, peacebuilding, and diplomacy. Um, I've 
I've focused primarily on being a diplomat for the Kurds. Uh, I'm uh, just yesterday I was with Ilham Ahmed, the president of the Federation, the Liberated Areas. She's in London at the moment, speaking with the government. Um, I I'm due in America quite soon. Um, I'm I'm just doing all I can really to spread the Kurdish message, uh, to educate people and to pressure the British government, uh, part of which is my work with an APPG, a Kurdish all-party parliamentary group. So I spend a lot of time in the British Parliament advocating for Kurdish issues. Um, let's finish off by just running through a few texts that I've got here that people have sent in over the course of the last hour and a quarter. And Jason in Bristol says, how do we know your guest upheld the rules of the Geneva Convention? How do we know that war crimes weren't committed? The British Army adheres to the Geneva Convention and has the moral compass to identify when it's transgressed. There seems to be the assumption that my enemy's enemy is my friend, so it's OK. But is that true? I'm very uneasy about what he did. Well, the, the British Army wasn't there. Let's not forget that it was the Kurds that were fighting ISIS. They were our only people on the ground, the only people who took and into ISIS. Did they subscribe to the Geneva they, Convention? They signed up to the Geneva right. Convention. Um, they've, it's a large military organ, uh, organization. And again, if you'd been in the army, you would, you would have had training on all of that. You'd have known exactly what the terms well, I, of it were. We were there to say, we were liberators. Uh, there was uh, times where we would go into villages and people were ecstatic taking off the burqa. They were uh, running up to our vehicles um, and uh, cheering us as we drove past. Uh, this was a genuine liberation. It, wasn't, it was nothing. It took the American and British men that had served in Iraq by surprise because uh, former military guys were joining the internationals and where they were once driving through Baghdad and Basra and other places in armoured convoys, uh, fearful of the local population and the insurgency, suddenly they were in Syria being, being mobbed by Syrian people saying, thank you so much for coming and helping us so um but me i uh, i went there to help syrian people the syrian people invited the internationals to come so um we of course abided by the geneva convention martin from twickenham says what a humbling and inspirational listen this has been if only i had the courage and fortitude of your guest we all owe a great debt of gratitude to people like him um this one's anonymous if your guest was so committed to fight isis why is he back here to enjoy the western democracy and benefits when he can see benefits. his quest through by Gosh. helping the locals also how many people did he maim injure or kill further did he harm any innocent people knowingly or unknowingly he should be held to account well i i i went to fight the islamic state I um, was alongside Syrian people, the, the ordinary Syrian people of the SDF, Arab, Kurd, Yazidi, who were fighting uh, against ISIS with American support. I did not go out to harm people, quite the opposite. I went out to protect people. And um, any comparisons with me and ISIS uh, are just plain wrong. It's just not who I am as a person. Well, I could spend the rest of the hour reading out texts and tweets um, praising you few criticizing you but i'd say it's sort of 90 10 in percentage terms mesa it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you for being so open and i think uh, i think we've learned an awful lot about what's happened in syria over the last few years <laughs>